hello everyone and thank you for being here. Uh, I want to appreciate to Art Basel to have this opportunity to have this talk uh, in this place at this time. Um, uh, we are now here um, uh, uh, in order to present a project uh, that is going to be launched in September of this year. is the Arts Anthology Almanac Project. It's, a, it's the first publication that will gather the exhibitions of different museums and art galleries all over the world on technology-based art. Um, this talk is actually trying to uh, bring into the audience the artistic, um, with artistic interest, the importance of perception in the creativity process of, for artists and in the research uh, process for scientific. And uh, in order to do so, we have two really good uh, speakers now here. And it is, uh, Michael Doser is the deputy director of the physics department of the CERN, the European Organization for Nuclear Research of Geneva, Switzerland. Thank you for being here. And um, he's a particle physicist specialized in antimatter and is currently leading an experiment to measure the gravitational interaction of antimatter for the first time. Um, he has had actually many years of outreach and activities, including a number of conferences and relations with artists. What is uh, really interesting for the talk that we are going to have. And um, Don Foresta is the founder and the research, and uh, sorry, is the founder of the research artist and coordinator of Marcel, that is the Multimedia Art Research Center and Electronic Laboratories of Paris, France. It's a very international network online um, and offline, uh, in, in offline activities that they do. Um, this um, this uh, network has been happening thanks for his uh, long experience on the subject. He's an artist himself, but also is a theoretic, theoretical um, um, using new technologies in art for over 25 years. Um, he uh, is now a visiting research associate at the London School of Economics and professor at the École Nationale Supérieure des Arts at Paris. Um, he has um, published uh, in 1991 the Mons Multi Multiples, that is actually specialized on the relation on art and science. And his first online exchange was in 1981 uh, with the MIT in the Center for Advanced Visual Studies at MIT, where he was a fellow in relation with the American Center in Paris, where he was the director of the Media Art Program. Um, he has also been the commissioner, the commissioner of the 42nd Venice Biennale in 1986, and he built at that time the first computer network between artists, an effort that has actually keep working on and um, has been developed into what is today the Marcel Network. Marcel Network is an artistic, educational and cultural experimentation network with over 120 members from 22 countries. It's really one of the largest network on the field of technology-based art. So um, the topic that we are going to move into now um, is um, trying to explain and trying to uh, make a dialogue about the importance of perception and in and the importance of perception uh, in the human evolution through artistic uh, research and through scientific research. So um, uh, Don is going to start the talk um, showing us uh, through some, some historical examples on how the representation of reality has been modified in art. So you can start with your presentation. Okay. Okay, I'm going to do uh, a highly selective, very short uh, art history uh, demonstration talking about representation, uh, or certainly a part or an approach to representation. Uh, this is a Van Eyck painting, as you can see, uh, from the middle, uh, from the early part of the 15th century, uh, that for me is a representation of the social, the idealistic social organization of the time, 
Uh, what's represented in this painting is a very, very clear uh, designation of the social order as it was imagined in an idealistic form in the Middle Ages. Uh, and that is actually what's being represented here. Uh, a change in that representation is shown quite clearly uh, in this particular painting, uh, Pintoricchio, which was uh, about 60 years later, uh, and is for me a very, very clear representation of the value change between the Middle Ages and the Renaissance. Uh, in this particular painting, we can see, as a matter of fact, that uh, the church is still there, but not represented by Christ the Lamb. The church is there represented in its political format at, by the Pope. Uh, the church is also no longer in the center of the image, but off to the left. Uh, the people are no longer represented in a very clear social order as we had in the Van Eyck painting, but actually just represented in a very pell-mell kind of mixed uh, group of human beings. And what takes center stage is the representation of infinity through perspective. Uh, perspective being at that time in the early Renaissance the representation of both a scientific and an artistic space. Uh, so I think those two paintings show quite a very clear difference in representation of the social values that they, that, uh, that they represented, represented at that time. And now a very, very quick jump to a more modern era, painting by Cezanne, uh, which once again expresses a whole different set of values uh, in a very interesting way, and in a way that is derived from the Renaissance in that it's a play on perspective. Uh, in this particular painting, what he uh, actually is representing is the same subject from several points of view. In other words, it's no longer the single point perspective of the Renaissance, but actually is a multiple perspective, which is diagrammed here. You, you can actually begin to understand the, the, the so-called visual distortions in this painting of by Cezanne when you begin to realize that you're looking at certain things in the painting from a different point of view. So actually what he's managed to do in a single painting is bring in several points of view. That's also uh, very much the point behind this particular work by Marcel Duchamp, uh, Les uh, Trois Stoppages Etolans, uh, which is a representation on the part of Duchamp of the fact that there is not a single standard meter, but there are actually several of them. In other words, Duchamp with this work is, is expressing the same idea as Cezanne is that we take into account the several points of view. And I think, again, just in those two, uh, those two works, you begin to see the beginning of a change in representation of a new kind of reality. Uh, for me, and this is very much my personal opinion, what I think this is actually demonstrating is the beginning of a key value in the artistic experimentation in the 20th century, which is based on interactivity. Uh, the fact that you can actually see a, a same thing from a number of points of view, and uh, that's expressed even further in other Duchamp works. This particular work combines a 19th century definition of the human being in society, in that the, the nef moul malik, the nine male molds, are actually representations of different 19th century uh, professions. And over that, he's laid, once again, the stoppage, in other words, these variations of the meter. So he's actually contrasting a 19th century point of view of kind of technocratic uniform view of the human being with a 20th century point of view of having several different kinds of standard meters as measures. And in this particular painting, Duchamp actually takes those different standard meters and puts them into a network. And this is actually the painting that we took as our logo for the Marcel Network because we think that in accumulating various 
standard meters or each individual's standard meter, we're actually coming up with a notion of interactivity and collective intelligence. And this is in fact uh, the way Duchamp describes it, that each work actually has two poles, the artist and the spectator, and of equal importance. So the whole idea is that the spectator is actually brought in to complete the work, and by completing the work, makes that work his or her own. Uh, once again, another form of interactivity. So, Michael. Yeah, how interactivity is um, approached through science? So in, in science, interactivity is um, not a main topic in general, but in, in physics in particular, there's a parallel development between the 19th century view of science and the 20th century view of science, where interactivity or some form of interactivity plays a role. I'm thinking particularly in, from the point of view of uh, points of view. So in the 19th century, you have very much a static universe, an absolute scale of time and uh, space. In the 20th century, it becomes much more a relative point of view. It's of course not surprising at that point was the birth of uh, the special theory of relativity where different observers will observe the same uh, process and come to different conclusions about the same process. Nevertheless, in, in that particular context, there's a very clear rule of how to transform the observations from one system to another, from one observer to another. There's another point where an observer plays an important role and that is of course in quantum mechanics where the observer modifies the process that is being observed at that point. But what I would really like to come to is a third point where interactivity plays a role, and that is the passage from concentration on individual object, objects, individual uh, examples of um, objects, such as here in this drawing by, by Heckel, of different forms of uh, diatoms, to a more systemic point of view. A systemic in the sense that one has to take into account not just the individual objects themselves, but also their interactions, and the interactions of the interactions. So it gets to be a very complex system. Now, I'm a particle physicist, so in principle, you could say that this is the most reductionist of sciences, because what we do is take uh, electrons and bounce them off other electrons. You can't be much more reductionist like th than that. And what happens when you do that, for example, in bubble chamber images, such as this one here, you see the interactions of the individual particles. You see, you can visualize, represent the trajectories, the motions, the energies of every single participant in the interaction. If you look at this picture, you would think that it is absolutely most, the simplest possible uh, system to understand because they're really just an electron and another electron and other particles being produced. In order to describe this system, Feynman has come up with mathematical rules, mathematical procedures that are inspired by the image th itself, by the image of bubble chambers, but that are also inspired by mathematical concepts themselves, which allow a calculation of these individual processes. So starting from an individual electron bouncing off another individual electron, you come to a mathematical description, which, if you take it far enough, will lead to interactions with other particles. If one looks at these graphs, what they're actually representing is interactions of one particle with another through a mediator. The mediator interacts with yet another particle. Their creation of particle, antiparticle pairs, which annihilate again, so that in order to describe exactly what is happening at the level of a collision between or bouncing one electron off another, you have to take into account all these other possible graphs, all these other possible effects, be it a creation of another electron, anti-electron pair, a proton, anti-proton, up to uh, formation of an elephant and an anti-elephant, which pop into existence for a very short time and then disappear again. All these effects have to be taken into account. Now, the only way you can do that and come up to a result that allows you to compare with experiment, to really ca carry out the calculations, is if you can carry out a trick, which is to neglect, at some level, these higher order effects. Elephants and anti-elephants hardly ever appear, so you can safely neglect them, but you will not get the absolutely correct result. The result you obtain will be slightly off from what it really should be if you had done all the calculations. So you get um, perception a little distorted somehow. Slightly wrong perception, yes. 
And um, how perception has been uh, of relevance on the artist uh, works in history? Well, I, I, I think the best way of uh, responding to that is to talk about how art affects perception uh, rather than perception affecting art, even though it's more or less the same way. And uh, the quote that I often use is, is McLuhan's famous quotation about the artist being the educator of perception. And uh, that, again, I think has been something often experimented throughout the 20th century. This, again, is Marcel Duchamp. And this is an installation that he built in 1942. And I think a lot of installation art is about that. The art is affected by the presence of, of the spectator within it, not necessarily this particular one, but it did create an atmosphere where spectators were actually obliged to very carefully march over all these ropes. And in that fashion, they become an actual part of the work. And I think that's, that's an underlying, again, 20th century invention of creating spaces, of artists creating spaces uh, that the spectator deals with. And by dealing with that space, the spectator, again, completes the work. Again, this is, uh, this is the way uh, Duchamp describes that particular action. And I think what he's responding to uh, in many ways is just exactly that, the artist affecting uh, perception and, again, the education of perception. I want to show just a couple of artists to demonstrate that. This is Robert Irwin, uh, and this is one of his early paintings. Irwin started out uh, as very much of an abstract expressionist and then began to eliminate a lot of elements of his painting until he was actually dealing uniquely in light. This is, this is a real painting. This is actually metal uh, affected by the light. But it was the work that led him to see that actually what he could do was create installations which were nothing more than light. Uh, and then once again, completing that installation became the work of the spectator. This is one of the first. It's a very bad picture, but it's, it's one that amuses me the most. Uh, basically, after studying this space in the Museum of Contemporary Art in Chicago for a rather long period of time, he completed the space by doing two things. One, outlining it in black tape and changing the fluorescent light bulbs uh, because he was very aware of how different light bulbs give off different light and that actually affects uh, the, the perception of that particular space. And the anecdote about this was that the museum people who worked in the space and who knew the space came by when he finished this piece and said, oh, did you put the pillar in there? Because <laughs> they had never seen the pillar before. Uh, but the way he converted the space brought that pillar out to their, to their presence to their, and into their perception. And of course, this is, uh, this is Irwin responding to that, uh, uh, to that idea and really the underlying line ideas in his work. And I think the nicest one is that perception is actually the subject of art. And uh, this is where I think uh, there is that parallel between art and science in the 20th century where science was really proposing a whole new series of representation of reality and artists in parallel were responding. Uh, one of the ways that I've actually expressed this is by saying that science has invented new spaces and artists have made them livable. Okay, another artist playing very much with the same idea, Jim Terrell. Again, this is an early Terrell piece where we're still talking basically about an object, but an object lit. Uh, and then later work of Terrell actually gets into uh, installations that are nothing but light. I don't, you've probably all experienced the Jim Terrell piece uh, where one of these rectangles is actually just a rectangle of light, but the way that he's actually constructed it and so forth changes the way uh, we perceive. Uh, one of the first ones that I saw that he did was a gray rectangle uh, that looked like a flat painting uh, when I approached it, I could see that it wasn't flat, that it was actually a space. 
Uh, and then when I backed up, it went flat again. But the thing that intrigued me the most was that I could see a grain in that, and there wasn't any grain. Uh, and uh, Jim Terrell is someone I know, and I said, why do I see the grain? What is that? And he said, it's your retina. So actually what we were doing, what I was doing, was projecting something from me into that space and once again completing it. And again, uh, this allowed me to actually see my own retina. So it was, it was quite an experience and I'm sure that many of you have seen the same. What I try to do is explain this uh, in this particular way, uh, by creating the a relationship between the human being and everything outside the human being. Uh, that there is us as human beings and there's everything else that's out there and we have two ways of interfacing with what's out there. One is our perception, uh, which means seeing what's out there. And the other is structure coming back which is the way we explain what's out there. And that explanation can be a lot of different things. That explanation can be ancient mythology, it can be contemporary religion, it can be science, it can be art, but these are all structures made by the human beings to explain what they're actually perceiving. And then once we have that circle in place, we understand that structure and perception are interactive that we see actually based on what we understand as being out there. So once again, we're actually fooling our own perception. And uh, one of the ways that I relate this to the art and science thing is creating that diagram again, but then developing more of an extension of it, calling nature really reality. Uh, and then again, defining where one or the other works principally. And in this particular diagram, what I'm trying to do is show what McLuhan called the education of, the, of perception by the artist and showing that throughout the 20th century, art really led us to see in different ways. And by leading us to see in different ways, they were actually preparing people to understand structure uh, new structures, different structures in another way, which is principally where science works. Uh, sorry, I didn't translate this in, in, into English, but I'm sure you can understand it. And while I think that perception is, is predominantly the area where art functions and science predominantly works on the structures and how we understand reality, there's obviously crossover in both. Yeah. Is, is this true as a science, as a scientific, um, uh, so much involved in this field? Um, do you actually also use perception and structures to, to understand the truth of reality? Yeah, so the, the difficulty in, in science, is, especially 20th century science, is that many of the objects that are being studied are not open to our perception anymore. If I'm talking about the infinitely small, the infinitely large, uh, things like dark matter, dark energy, all these things are not open to perception. You have to proceed indirectly. Um, the models that you create are never going to be perceptive, but only structural. Uh, we're, it, it's clear that you're never going to get a complete picture but a substantially good approximation of reality. And, and physicists, or, or scientists in general, are of course aware of the, the pitfalls of the perceptive apparatus that uh, we're, we're growing up with when transported into these new spaces. If you're growing up in a three-dimensional space in which gravity just has a standard strength, and you're starting to think about uh, very heavy objects, um, the area of general relativity, or the infinitely small where quantum mechanics or quantum field theory plays a role, these perceptions are going to completely fool you. And this is something that scientists are aware of, so they're very careful to, well, first of all, not trust their perceptions, try to test their models against reality. And this is one area where science has a big advantage over other endeavors, and that is you can go out and ask the question. You can ask nature, what are you? Is my model good or is it bad? Can I th throw it out the window? Or is it a better approximation of reality than the previous one? So you, you approximate 
an understanding of nature by steps, one after the other. If you listen to Bohr's model of quantum mechanics, for example, at the moment where you can make solid predictions, you've understood how nature works. Now, this is not what everybody else would consider to be an understanding, because you may have understood the behavior at an atomic level, but you don't really know what else is happening. Um, you can... Oh, this is yours oh, still. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, you, you've accumulated a bunch of facts. This is perhaps, this would be, would, would correspond to a 19th century view of facts. You just accumulate a number of images of individuals. In the 20th century, this accumulation of facts looks like this. This is, for example, a series of biochemical processes happening in a cell. Every single one of these is understood and known, and so on a, an atomic level, if you wish, you understand exactly what's happening at the cell. So let me give you an image. Uh, think of this, rather than, than these uh, biochemical processes, as atoms of oxygen and of hydrogen bouncing around wildly, and you can describe their interactions at every level. As a physicist, you should be happy with that. That's all you want. But if you do not take a step back from this image, from this profusion of information, and are able to see that these oxygen and hydrogen atoms are actually forming a water droplet in a spring storm, you haven't really understood what's going on. So it's not enough to have just understood the mathematics. It's not enough to have just developed um, models that describe reality. You also have to develop an inner understanding, an, an internal model of what these equations, what these models actually correspond to. In, in order to fully understand what they are. It, so it, it, it uh, starts to get into the, to, into the play, uh, the structure as a scientific, right? The structure that you were mentioning before. And the perception probably is also developed, right? So even though perception uh, you cannot, as a scientific, uh, fully trust, it, it, it really play a game, play in part of the game, right? Yeah. On the understanding of reality as a scientific, right? That's exactly it, yes. And um, I also want to uh, touch, um, of course, the, the subject um, of the relation and the increasing relation of artists uh, so much interested and in, uh, getting access also to new technologies um, and how you know scientifics are um, starting to uh, open bridges to to allow this creativity and this other way of thinking, this other way of perceiving perceiving things, um, um, playing a, a role and having an interest change of of uh, currents of thought. Um, what do you think, uh, both as you have both uh, experienced these uh, relationships over the years? Uh, what is the future and what is this, uh, why is this important for the human evolution, this collaboration? Don, you want to start? Okay. Uh, yeah. What we actually tried to do this afternoon is formalize a lot of conversations that Michael and I have had uh, for a long time. And one of those conversations is about the collaboration between art and science. Uh, and as you probably know, a lot of funding bodies around the world uh, have put money into so-called art and science collaborations. Uh, and for both of us, they're, they're generally forced marriages uh, and, and really don't work too well. Art and science are two different things and they are very different things with very different objectives. And if an artist and a scientist actually do work together, the first thing they have to decide on is whether they're going to do art or science. Uh, but at the same time, I feel quite strongly that if we look at the two, uh, and we look at the two from those two different points of view, uh, if artists look at science and scientists look at art, uh, we can find parallels. Uh, we tried to touch on a few of those parallels in a very generalized way. Uh, but I don't think we should force any kind of collaboration, because I think that generally produces work that's quite bad. Uh, I think it becomes, from the artist's side, an illustration of a scientific idea, which I don't think is terribly profound. Uh, or from the scientist's side, the scientist becomes the, the artist's technician, uh, and that's not a very profound collaboration either. But there is, I think, a lot of open space for exchanging ideas, and we do have to admit that within our society, 
we've given to science the role to define our reality, uh, and reality is what art deals with. So I think uh, it's almost uh, essential for artists to understand what reality science is actually proposing. So for, for me, the, if there's any collaboration between art and science, it's usually at the level of a mutual influencing, mutual opening of minds, uh, rather than a concrete outcome. Uh, by, by being exposed to different views, different points of views, different ways of looking at the world, different ways of, of interpreting also the world, uh, both groups can profit immensely. Mm -hmm. And the, the one tool that I see that may make this more possible than in the past is computers. Uh, with, with computers and simulations, take on a much, much larger role than in the past. And with a simulation, what you can do is start playing with the parameters. You can start uh, trying to extract meaning from uh, the mess that was on the previous picture and try to visualize it to represent it in a certain way. And this is something where scientists generally do not have a, a very um, efficient toolkit. They're not used to doing, to dealing with very complex systems and with coming up with ways to represent something that is very complex, that has many interactions, and where you're trying to find a very small signal often, something that is hidden among a plethora of, of noise. And this is an area where, where both scientists and artists are um, on an equal footing in a way because they're both using a, a common tool. They're both using computers, simulations, to be able to communicate with each other and try to exchange their concepts. Wouldn't you also say that they're both uh, dealing in complex systems? Absolutely, yes, that's exactly, uh, and as science progresses, certainly to talk about the science side, uh, the systems that we're studying get more and more complex. The, the simple things have been done in the past, now we're looking at very complex system with very complex, complex interactions. Okay, uh, this once again is, is kind of a summation of of the collaboration. Uh, John Wheeler is a very, very well-known uh, American uh, physicist. He was a student of Niels Bohr, and this definition of reality that he proposes is very much of a product of quantum physics, uh, but at the same time, uh, it's a very much a product of the kind of interactivity that we were talking about, where, where the spectator actually completes the work of the artist in, in a very interactive way. But I did I uh, want to go back and finish with Marcel Duchamp. Uh, just talk about that level of inspiration because this is a famous quote that goes back to uh, conversations that were being held be by the artists among themselves in the early part of the 20th century uh, up until World War I. At that particular time, one of the things that was being discussed both, both spiritually and scientifically was the idea of the fourth dimension and non-Euclidean geometry. And as Duchamp says here, it didn't always mean that the artist understood it from a scientific point of view, but it was enough to make them change the way they regarded the world. So in that particular case, they were using science and scientific ideas to actually change their own perception. And then their work began to change ours. So thank you very much for, for this wonderful uh, output. And I would like to know if anybody uh, in the audience want to ask some questions to, to Don or, or to Michael. I just uh, want to, to, you have the perception of the object, but I think in the terms of art and science, shouldn't we have the perception of who is doing the object? Because if you take the case, for example, in the art world of Olafur Eliasson, he does in an artistic way what a scientific does. When he does all these, uh, you know, he played with all these uh, lights and the effect of lights on your eye and things like that. Mm -hmm. This is, has been done by scientists before. But the fact that he takes it out of the laboratory and puts it in the museum, you perceive it now as an art, uh, um, uh, a, work of, um, a work of art. So it's also the perception of who is doing it, no? Yeah, I think that's a little bit what's implied when we said that you have to take into account the whole system. That when you interact with a piece, you're actually interacting with a whole system. It's an interesting point, too, because what the artists are trying to say is they're, they're moving the position of art. They're really kind of taking it off the wall of a museum and putting it back into the process. 
So the actual art experience is no longer something that you go and hang on the wall, but it's the way the spectator interacts with it. And, you know, that, that theoretically is where art always should have been. And sometimes it's, uh, I'm sorry, but it's, uh, sometimes it's actually a great way for the audience to, to understand concepts that otherwise will be really difficult to them uh, to access them for the general public. So I think also artists do a, a great job in, in explaining visually things that scientific have been um, getting um, into, right? That's also really interesting, right? But that would be more in, sen in the direction of an illustra illustration of what um, science is and what the objects of science are. But I think it's also interesting to see the, the, what, how scientists then react to artists reacting to scientists. Mm -hmm. Because if, as this example that you give of an artist going into the lab and, and observing what the scientists are doing and then taking it out of the lab and bringing it to the to general public, the scientists involved in their science often do not reflect on the way they're doing their science or what it means mm -hmm. to them, how, how they feel about it and how, how they perceive then. By extracting it out of the lab and forcing them to look at it from the outside, they themselves, the scientists themselves, will have a different appreciation of what they're doing and how they're doing their work. Yeah. yeah. It's just an art market also in the middle. Okay, I'll, I'll forget about the art market here. This is <laughs> There's a, a piece that's um, called Audience, which is dealing with the role of the controller and the, or the performer, and the art doesn't exist literally without the audience, and it's a Design Miami Basel. In, at the end of the hall, and it's by a collective of artists called Random International who came from design, interaction design. And I've been, I'm a curator who was just sort of fascinated with the fact that they were making performance art sculpture before it was, I don't even know if, you, if there's a title for it, but I didn't know where to place it or where to put it. And the reaction has been incredible. And anybody who's interested in this topic or has anything to write about it or say about it should really come see this show. Um, it's about five minutes from here. And there's another piece called Study for a Mirror, which is, well, I don't want to describe it. I want you to experience it. OK. Where do you see that? Or? Design Miami Basel. When you leave Both of them um, uh, and you go left outside Unlimited, you'll see there's a little uh, bridge. Um, where you go under the bridge, and you'll see a huge yellow yeah. wall. And it's in that building. And it's, it's actually Hall 5, Design Miami Basel. OK, thank you. Somebody else want to have some questions? What about the representations, the changing uh, representation of the body, human body? Mm -hmm. I'm afraid that I'm not sufficiently familiar with uh, changes in, in the medical system. But I think the example that I gave there of the um, the biochemical processes that are running inside the body show a very um, atomic view, a very reductionist view of what is going on in the body. You can know everything that's going on in there, but it won't tell you a thing about what a cell or a human being is. So although you will, you'll be able to understand the biochemics, you won't understand what your feelings, what your conception, perceptions are. And as far as I can see as an outside scientist just reading general scientific literature, the the movement has been very much in this direction, in the direction of atomizing the understanding of uh, the human body, rather than trying to see what uh, a more holistic point of view would be. I see also that there's a change recently, that it's going more into um, trying to understand um, long, long distance relationships between different parts of the body, trying to take into account more the, the overall organism. But this is more recent. My, my question, yes, was uh, how this uh, maybe atomic approach could transform the per body perception because we have actually, you, you, you quite quickly start to speak about medicine and it's only one way mm -hmm. yeah. to see the body. So I, I think it's, uh, it will change with all this um, atomic approaches, I mean, minimalistic. Uh. Certainly that kind of approach drives a biochemical view of the body and a, a, a functional view of the, the processes happening in the body. It doesn't at all foster a more um, global view of what is going on and, and even non-medical views of the body. I agree with that. 
I think there's also, again, this is, you could extend, I mean, I know where your question is coming from because I know you're a dancer. Uh, and that's something that interests me very much because uh, uh, Maku mentioned Marcel. Marcel is, is this experiment that we've set up with myself and a number of other people to work artistically in very high bandwidth networks with interactivity. That's the whole purpose of the thing. And one of our ultimate proofs of the effectiveness of virtual space as a human space is if we can make dance work in virtual space. So you're actually eliminating the physicality of dance, but you're hoping to redo dance in such a fashion that the emotion works and that dance actually functions in that virtual space. And I think that is an aspect of interactivity that's very important. We also see that in the installation art, where in the beginning it was merely the presence of a human being that affected that installation. Now a lot of installation work is becoming much, much more sophisticated, where they're taking into, into account body movement, uh, body temperature, uh, sound, a number of other things. Uh, so, what I think is ultimately happening with the, with the potential virtual space of high bandwidth networks is a synthesis between all the arts. That it's really the performing arts and the plastic arts all functioning within the same virtual space interactive, interactively. And I, I think that's probably the, the current direction of artistic experimentation. Yeah, well, thank you very much for uh, attending this talk. And if you are uh, more interested in, in this subject, it will be maybe interesting uh, to check the, the website of, of Don. It's Marcel, it's uh, mm and then marcel.org. Uh, it's a really interesting network of professionals on the field. And also, when the arts anthology is published, you will also see visually uh, certain exhibitions around the world specialized on the field of, of these collaborative um, uh, disciplines. So maybe you are interested. Thank you very much.